Good afternoon. Welcome to the May 19th meeting of the Phoenix City Council. I will now call the meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilwoman Ansari. Here. Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilwoman Guardado. Here. Councilwoman O'Brien. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Vice Mayor Garcia. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Thank you. Mario Barajas is with us today to provide interpretation services. Mario, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, Mayor, thank you. Hello, as previously mentioned, my name is Mario Barajas, and together today with my colleague Carmen Cota, we're gonna be serving as today's Spanish interpreters. I'll now take a few moments to introduce ourselves to our Spanish-speaking audience. Muy buenas tardes a todos, mi nombre es Mario Barajas, Junto con mi colega Carmen Cota, estaremos facilitándoles con la interpretación del español del día de hoy. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much for your services. Will the city clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6849 through 6854, S47541 through 47589, and resolutions 21924. Thank you. We next go to items one and two, which are related to the meeting minutes. Councilman Guardado, have you had a chance to review the February 19th, 2020 meeting minutes? Yes, I have. And I will make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second from Councilwoman Stark. Any comments? All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Passes unanimously. Councilman DeCicio, have you had a chance to review the March 4th, 2020 meeting minutes? I move their approval, Mayor. Second. Thank you, Councilman. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Passes unanimously. We next move to boards and commissions, items three through five. Vice Mayor Garcia, do you have a motion to approve? Do you have a motion? Yes, Mayor. Motion to approve May 19th, 2021, Mayor and City Council Boards and Commissions nominations. Second. We have a motion and a second. We do have one member of the public to uh, address the council on these items, Andre Williams. And um, Andre, we will take comments on items three through five, so you can comment on today's boards and commissions or uh, any of the other items um, in our boards and commissions nominations. Andre, the floor is yours. Mayor, it does appear that Andre is not on the line. Wonderful. We have a motion on the floor for May 19th Mayor and City Council Board and Commission nominations. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Passes unanimously. We next move to item agenda four, request for reconsideration of a portion of item three from the May 5th, 2021 City Council formal meeting. Do we have a motion? Mayor, I move to reconsider portion of item three from the May 5th 2021 City Council formal meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. No. Guardado. Mayor, just clari clarification. This is just for reconsideration, correct? correct. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. I apologize, Councilman. Can you repeat that? Yes. Thank you very you much. Oh, thanks. Vice Mayor Garcia. Yes. There you go. Yes. Passes seven one. 
Item five is the reconsideration of ethics commission's appointments. Do we have a motion? Mayor, I move to approve um, the five candidates for the ethics commission appointments. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. No. Guardado. Mayor, can I explain my vote? Please do. Okay. I will be, I'll make my comments um, short as they haven't changed much from the last meeting. I don't think the foundation for this commission is where it needs to be. Most of us voting today were not here for the first conversations during the formation of this ordinance. I am in full support of accountability and transparency, but I think we are setting these members up for failure with many structural issues. Among other problems, I think ensuring this is an independent process is of the most utmost importance. I don't think the council should be the body having the final say over ethics complaints against its own members. I also think Mr. Thacker has some great ideas on how we ensure the members of the commission are selected and vetted. Again, I don't know any of these appointees beyond their resumes, so do not wish to speak on them personally, but as a matter of process, the ordinance doesn't look far beyond politically, political party and involvement when vetting candidates. I will be voting no today, but I am willing to work with staff of these recommendations to, in, to get insurance and having an independent process. So I will be voting no. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Garcia. May I explain my vote? Yes. I too would be excited to relook at similar to the comments of Councilwoman Guardado. Um, to I wasn't around when this happened to understand the intention. Um, I don't think we should hold anything against these five folks who've been vetted. Seems like the votes aren't there today, but I would like to look in the future. But um, I'll be voting yes. Gallego. Yes. Mayor, it fails six to two because it requires seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Thank you to the Judicial Selection Advisory Board who worked hard to produce these nominations and to our uh, interview committee. And thank you to everyone who applied and participated in this process. I still believe this is an important body, but we move forward. Um, I will turn now to our city attorney to introduce public comment and the importance of civil discourse at Phoenix City Council meetings. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the public may speak for up to two minutes to comment on agenda items to be discussed. Comments must be related to the agenda item and the action being considered by the council. General comments that go beyond the scope of the agenda item must be made during the citizen comment session at the end of the agenda. In addition, speakers must present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language and personal attacks on members of the public, council members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will lose their opportunity to continue to speak. Thank you. We next move to liquor license applications. The city of Phoenix advises the state. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Uh, motion to approve items 10 to 90 through 90, except the following items 26, 46, 52. Vice Mayor. I'm yes. sorry, this is the city clerk. Um, oh. At this time, we're on liquor license items six through nine. I apologize. All right, sorry, <laughs> got ahead of myself. Uh, motion to approve item six through nine. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please signal nay. Passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Try it again. I went flawless my first time. I had to make a mistake at some point. So motion to approve items 10 through 90, except the following. Items 26, 46, 52, 61, 62, 
65, 67, and 70. Items 53 and 88 are requested to be continued to the June 2nd, 2021 uh, meeting. Item 48 includes additional information and excluding these items for public comment, 27, 45, and 89. Nice second. Job. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mayor, just to clarify, does that also include item 90? Excluding it from the for public comment. Why not include it? I believe you did want to include, uh, exclude item 90 or? Yes. yes, we do have a speaker for that item. Then we'll add item 90. Is that enough? Thank you very much. Yes. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Cecilio. Yes. Guardado. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Dark. Yes. Waring. Waring. Did you hear me? I can barely hear you, Councilman. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you sorry. now. Garcia. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-0. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and just um, for anyone who is watching, item 88, which is the southeast corner of 3rd Avenue and Coolidge Street, was continued to June 2nd, 2021. We next move uh, to an exciting item, 26, the reappointment of municipal court judge and chief presiding judge and salary consideration for the chief presiding judge. I will turn to our city manager to introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor. This is uh, a, an item for the council to reappoint two judges and then the, the council sets annually the salary of the chief presiding judge. There is one correction in the agenda uh, the uh, the number given for the chief presiding judge salary recommended. Uh, we have to clarify, correct that slightly for the benefit of our human resource system. So the number should be 211224. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. We will take this item in two different motions. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion to reappoint our two judges? Motion to reappoint the two judges. Yeah, sec. We have a motion and a second. I appreciate our municipal court in being partners in both trying to administer justice, but also being a partner in trying to make life better for the people we serve. Our chief judge has been very innovative and worked on programs, including the compliance assistance program to help people pay their, their bills. So I want to applaud both of our judges and um, thank them for their service to the city of Phoenix. I look forward to supporting this motion. Additional comments? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. Yes. Guardado. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Castor. Stark. Yes. Waring. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8-0. Congratulations to our presiding judge, Don Taylor, as well as Judge Navidad, who has been serving our city with distinction and has pushed for a better city as well. We are glad to have you. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on consideration of salary for the chief presiding judge? Yes, motion on... Salary consideration for chief presiding judge. Second. Second. Motion and a second. And um, for our city staff, does that meet HR's needs as a motion? Yes, Mayor, that's that motion will be for the item as corrected. Perfect. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. Yes. Guardado. Yes. 
O'Brien? Yes. Castor? Stark? Yes. Waring? I apologize, Councilman. It's it chops out your answer. Okay, yeah, I've got it on. I apologize to you. Uh, no. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Garcia. Yes. Gallego. Passes yes. seven one. We next move to item twenty seven, which is a, pr a proposed annexation at fifty first Avenue and Baseline Road in Council District seven. I will open the public hearing. We have two members of the public to address the council. We'll begin with Bob Frank, followed by Mark Rodriguez. Mr. Frank, the floor is yours. One moment, Mayor. Okay, Bob, you can proceed. All righty, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Excellent, well, thank you for the time uh, to speak. I just wanted to speak in favor of this uh, proposal. We're uh, planning to do a, a, a multifamily project here, right uh, behind the hospital near the retail center. And uh, we intend to do something very uh, positive for this particular uh, site and for the community. And uh, I don't have really much to add unless somebody has a question for me. I do not see any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Mayor. Do we have Mr. Rodriguez online? Mayor, he is not on the line. All right. Oh, I apologize. Mayor. I go? I'm so sorry. He is. Mark. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Mayor Kate Gallego and everybody. Can you hear me? I'm at the fries. <laughs> we can't hear you, Mark. Can you hear me now? Loudly and clearly. Hello, Mayor Kate right Gallego and everybody. It's good to hear from you guys again. It's because I live, I'm, I used to live on 51st Avenue and Baseline because I always like living over there when I was, when I was 18 years old. And even though I'm shopping at Fry's because, because I'm just nervous to talk to you guys and all that because, and also because I was trying to, have a conversation from all of you guys, including all of you city council members, is because that is because of, I'm very sorry that I'm nervous and all that. And because, it's because I'm just talking to the lady store clerks at Fry's and the shopping and I just need to. Because I'm just saying, I'm so sorry. That's all for me. Have a wonderful time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. We will close the public hearing. This item will be on a future agenda for a vote. We next move to item 45, which is uh, aquatic season extension weekends in September. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 45. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. We do have one member of the public to address the council. No, we have two members of the public to address the council. Uh, Brett Kleinman followed by Mark Rodriguez. Thank you very much, Mayor, members of the city council. I just, I wanted to get on here in case there was any opposition to this in any way to tell you how excited we are to have the Encanto Park pool open a couple extra weeks as well as every other city pool. And I think this is, something that you all should consider as a permanent basis, not just a, a single year thing. I, I don't understand why the pool closes as early as it does while the heat continues as long as it does past the end of our summer, quote unquote. So please uh, consider extending pool hours, opening earlier, staying open later in the year and allowing us to, for those of us that don't, don't have pools in our backyard, to go swim and enjoy a pool for more than just a couple of months in the dead heat of the summer. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Mark has left the meeting, so we will turn to council comments. Councilwoman Gordado. 
Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, this is very, very exciting. I, I know that we've been talking about this um, for for a little bit. I mean, last year we were in the middle of, of a pandemic and weren't able to open up our pools, but I just want to say that I'm very grateful for for everyone um, that works our pools, um, our lifeguards. I know that it's not easy. I know that it's hot summers, but very thankful for our, li for our lifeguards, for our Parks, Parks Department for making this happen. I know that it's not easy um, trying to get people to stick around an extra month um, to continue to keep our pools open, but I'm very excited to talk about how is it that we can continue this program. I know that it's been a hard year for our youth, um, that they've been stuck behind a screen for over a year and very hopeful that we can give some back to them um, with opening the pools on the weekends, I know that in District 5, um, we've been able to secure lifeguards at Startlight Pool, and we're working on, on the other pools as well. So very excited to be able to bring this to the community, and that, and hopefully I know that Ed and everyone else is committed to figuring out how do we how do we keep this as a as a new normal um, for our community. So very excited to vote on this, and also just reminding everyone when we talk about pools, we'll be doing free swimming lessons as well this year. So excited for, for that as well. So I am very excited um, to be able to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Vice Mayor. Mayor. We will go to the Vice Mayor and then Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. And I wanna thank Councilwoman Guardado for, for bringing this up. And also I found out that a couple other cities followed suit in, in providing um free free swimming lessons so your, your impacts are going beyond our city councilwoman i'm really excited that you know our youth have gone through a lot in the last year i did have a question for park staff i don't know if, if cynthia or someone's around yes council uh, vice mayor uh parks director cynthia uh aguilar is here cynthia don't worry about your nameplate <laughs> you're fine <laughs> Cynthia is here. Thank you. First of all, Cynthia, thank you so much for, for making the plan and, and making sure that this, the pools are going to be open and that this is extension is possible. One of the comments I had as I was talking to community folks or, or questions that they had is, I know we're not opening all pools, but there are some pools that are near each other. And so I was asked about um, the possibility of shuttles from one pool to another. Um, for example, in Central City, there's certain parks that are near Harmon Park that maybe we can shuttle some youth over. Is that something that we can do or have done in the past? Uh, good afternoon, Vice Mayor, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, yes, in the past we have done uh, some shuttling efforts, but this year is definitely unique. Uh, we would certainly have the ability to explore that. The one challenge that will be presented is that currently uh, we have, when we were at the City Council uh, back in March here, that we put in a rule, uh, if you will, that you have to be 16 years of, uh, of age or older in the pool. So if there's someone under 16, uh, they have to be with someone who is at least 16 years of age. And so that was the direction that we took from the City Council the last time we were here. Uh, so in this situation, we would just have to work through that and I come up with a schedule, uh, if you will, to look at where we could provide those shuttle services, but we'd be happy to evaluate that. All right, thank you. Would appreciate it if you all could evaluate. Obviously, do not want to stop this. I think this extension is great and I'm glad the pools will be open and the lessons will be free, but would appreciate um, to explore the possibility of, of rights. We are happy to do that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any additional council member comments? Roll call. Just me, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman DeCicio. Thank you. I'm looking at a screen and <laughs> appreciate the reminder. That's okay. I can easily be forgotten. That's not a problem. Uh, not at I all. I just wanted to thank Councilman Gord. <laughs> That's uh, It's okay. I just want to thank Councilman Guardado for what she did on this. Uh, the free swimming lessons are critical. As a kid, I grew up using a public pool or I would use my friend's pools, you know, so it's just where you learn and you do learn to swim there. My guess is in question to you, Brent Kleinman, I'm just guessing that some of the reason is we do use a lot of kids at our pools 
And once school starts, it's really hard to get them in there. But he does bring up a good point. I mean, the heat here in Arizona, you're still over 100 degrees by the end of September. And if we can find and strive for trying to keep our pools open at least a few more weeks, uh, maybe even to early October, I think it would serve a lot of individuals that don't have the money, the ability to have a pool in their backyard. And I think that brings up a really good point. I mean, there are so many kids out there. Our pools are pretty full. Uh, they have nowhere else to go and they don't have the money to be able to get into a pool uh, in their backyard. And um, I applaud her efforts on this thing and what she did on this. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. Yes. Guardado. Yes. <clears throat> O'Brien? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 0. We next move to item 46, which is an intergovernmental agreement with. Arizona State University Global Institute of Sustainability for Greenhouse Gas Emission Inventories. I will turn to Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited to see this on the agenda. Um, I think we all know that an accurate count of the city's greenhouse gas emissions will help guide strategic policy to combat the dangerous air pollution in our city. It's especially exciting to see that this partnership is with ASU's Global Institute of Sustainability. Um, and as I understand, our data is a little behind the last time we conducted uh, a study like this. It was back in 2018. Um, so it'll be very, very helpful as we begin to, or as we continue to work on our climate action plan and plan to roll that out at the end of the year that we have this accurate data. So just wanted to say that I'm very excited to see the, the city continue to move forward and um, be on the, the forefront um, of sustainability policy based on real science and data. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yeah. Motion to approve item 46. Second. We have a motion and a second from Councilwoman Ansari. I am also excited for this to move forward. Our partnership with ASU has helped us be widely recognized in this area and the biannual greenhouse gas inventories are essential to identifying emission sources and tracking the success of our emission reduction efforts. In February, there was some media stories about some inventories that were having challenges with accuracy and ours was ranked among the most accurate inventories. So we have a true credit to this partnership and to Arizona State University. Um, excited that they've been working with us now for almost a decade in this area. We were among the uh, first cities in our state to move forward and we'll continue to move forward this year. We're also glad to be expanding our partnership to look at a wide variety of areas, including sustainable purchasing, brownfields redevelopment, hazardous materials, and others. We have a great resource in Arizona State University, and it's great to take advantage of it. Additional council member comments. Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to explain my vote, and I'll. Uh, vote. I'll be very brief. Please. Do. I'm going to be voting no. Uh, the the reason why is because uh, a couple of years back, maybe three years back, I should say, the city was going to take an inventory of everybody's electrical use, and I just really am concerned. It's not about what they're looking to do, but I get very concerned when government starts getting involved into people's private business or into businesses themselves, keeps an inventory of what they do and they don't do. And I think it's an overreach of government. Other than that, I would normally be supportive of this as I have been on other issues. But I would get very concerned when government starts taking inventories of individuals. You know, to me, it's equated to spying. And I have a real problem with that, Mayor. Thank you very much. Guardado. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Waring.
Waring? No. No. No, thank you. Can... Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7-2. Wonderful. And I just would clarify ASU has been partnering with us on community wide inventories and inventory of city operations. So I would characterize it differently than one of my colleagues. Uh, we next move to item 52 development agreement with Levine baseline for public infrastructure improvements. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion. Motion to approve item 52. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, this is an exciting development in the 59th Avenue area near the 202 freeway. It is a development agreement in a very complex area from infrastructure perspective, which includes baseline wear. So there's some roads that are, some might say misaligned and the Levine conveyance channel. Um, this development is an amenity rich destination that includes retail that the community has been really asking for restaurants accompanying shops as well as a theater and entertainment complex and i'm really looking forward to supporting this item additional council member comments roll call i'm sorry yes decisio yes guardado yes o'brien yes pastor yes dark Waring? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. Items 61, 62, and 65 are related to the light rail and the Federal Transit Administration. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on 61, 62, and 65? Yes. Motion to approve items 61, 62, and 65. Good. A motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. Ansari? Yes. Decisio? No. Guardado? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Dark? Yes. Waring? Oh. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7-2. We next move to item 67, which is related to the solid waste ordinance. Will the city clerk please read the title? Item 67 is for ordinance 6849, an ordinance relating to solid waste amending Phoenix City Code Chapter 27, Residential Collection, Section 27-21. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 67. Second. Any discussion? I Roll call. Oh, uh, Councilwoman Pastor. Sorry. Um, my understanding is that uh, what's going to happen is that solid waste uh, could collect on commercial establishments that were previously residential dwelling units. Am I on target? So if they were previously um, homes, I'm assuming residential dwelling units, and then they've now made them commercial. That's the purpose. Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, you are correct. This is to uh, allow for collection at buildings that were previously residences, but that have through adaptive reuse become commercial establishments. Okay, thank you. Any additional comments? Roll call. I'm sorry. Yes. Decisio? Uh, Mayor, just a quick explanation. Uh, I'm going to be voting no. I just believe that you should have a, a policy across the board uh, as to what we do. It's got to be uniform. So if you allow one, you should allow all. Thank you, Mayor. Guardado? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. 
Pastor? Yes, and can I ask a question there? Uh, one of my colleagues mentioned some uh, an item, and I just want to understand because my understanding is that uh, the commercial trucks can't fit in those areas. Thank you, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor. That is correct. Uh, the commercial trucks have difficulty serving businesses of this type because the, the it's just too tight to get in and out. That is absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. And, and, and just to clarify, it does apply to any commercial business that is similarly situated. Dark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-1. Thank you. And just wanted to uh, remind my colleagues, traditionally, once we have begun roll call, we do not uh, debate an item, but we do explain our, our votes. We next move to item 70, parking meter equipment and services RFP. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 70. Second. Second. Councilman Waring. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Uh, so I've talked about this issue before with the parking meters. Um, obviously, my experience with parking meters in the last year is limited because everything was closed. But uh, prior to that, if you were downtown uh, and you were anybody trying to use our parking meters, I would defy people to try to see on the screens it's, it's been pretty much every meter I've used, but I'm sure there's probably different facings and so forth. In the bright sun, you simply can't read like how much time you have, um, how much you paid and so forth. You're putting in a credit card, you know, there are limits, but that's still, you kind of want to know. And if you don't want to pay for two hours, if you only need an hour, et cetera, I, I've had that frustrating experience quite a few times. And, um, it's just, it's probably an annoying way for a lot of our either winter visitors or regular downtown folks trying to go to a restaurant or something to start their trip downtown. So I would like some assurance that that's not going to continue to be the case. I've also had meters that didn't function. I've, I've tried, like I said, now in the distant past, more than a year ago, you know, called those in uh, when I've had the opportunity, but it's been so prevalent in the times that I've had to use the meters that it's been concerning to me. So can I have some assurance that that's not going to be the case no matter who is, is handling our meters? Uh, Mayor and Councilman Waring and members of the City Council, uh, yes, we agree with you 100% that that is not acceptable for those meters that have been in that condition. And uh, the Street Transportation Department led by Keeney Knutson is working toward getting those fixed, working with the current vendor to, to make sure those are repaired. Um, and, and I'll hand it off to Keeney to explain a little bit more about what they're doing to get that accomplished. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, members of the council. Uh, we have about 1,700 smart meters that are capable of taking uh, credit card uh, payment. And of those 1,700, uh, we have completed refurbishment uh, or getting new screens for 760, or I'm sorry, 670 of those. Um, we have 220 more meters that we're in the process of getting refurbished. We just took um, a receipt of those last Friday. We're checking those out before we deploy those. Um, with all those told, we'll have over half of our um, smart parking meters will have been refurbished uh, since October. So we are taking this seriously. We know it's an important source of revenue for the city, uh, also an important aspect to our downtown businesses and visitors who are coming into the downtown area. Uh, as we move forward with this RFP, we will make that sure that maintenance and um, uh, durability of the systems um, that we have, whether we continue with the existing parking meters or if we get new parking meters through that system, that we will make sure that the, the quality of the experience for our visitors and people coming to downtown um, is not um, as, as you've experienced over the last year. Uh, Mayor Keeney, I, I appreciate that because uh, I did mention that. I can't remember when that was, but um, exactly, but it's been probably at least a year since the last time I talked about this. And I think other members and also, when I started talking, had had similar experiences. How long do those screens last? 
um, because it's not just that they're nice the day after they're replaced. You know, they've got to be durable because they get scratched up and, you know, they're obviously out there baking in the sun all day. Um, how long can we expect that to, to last and be functional? Um, so, so Mayor, um, uh, Councilman Waring, members of the council, uh, I think the last time this was brought up was when we had a uh, contract action back in December at the formal meeting there. So we took, we made sure we did some actions. We actually had a report to our transportation subcommittee earlier this year about that as well. So re with regards to the, the, the meters, we do have a warranty for them. And so we first make sure that wherever we have warranty issues with them where we can proceed it through a warranty. But we also have worked out a deal with the, the manufacturer where we can get the refurbishment done at a lower cost than replacing the meter completely at a same savings about $300 per meter. Um, but the, the durability or the, the, the time those last, depending, it just depends on the wear. But we've also um, increased some staffing um, to be able to be out there to check the status of the mirror so we can make sure we're on top of these uh, quality issues and performance issues uh, quicker than we have been in the past. Well, I, I do appreciate that. And I, I was going to suggest, can we get some people on it? So it sounds like you already did that. So that's, that's why you're the best. And I appreciate it. Um, I just, you know, my my limited spot checks showed 100% of them were defective, and it sounds like you've kind of confirmed that and are just replacing, if not all of them, almost all of them. So I just, I hope they have a better product for the contracts going forward. Uh, but I appreciate you looking into it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman Waring. When you brought this up at a previous meeting, I very much agreed with you. I, too, have struggled with many of the meters in our downtown. Any additional council member comments? Roll call. Ansari? Yes. Decisio? Yes. Guardado? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. We next move to item 89 adoption of the ordinance adding new chapter 20 to Phoenix City Code, establishing the Office of Accountability and Transparency. Will the city clerk please read the title? Item 89 is for Ordinance G6851, an ordinance establishing the governing language for Office of Accountability and Transparency by creating a new Chapter 20, Sections 20-1 through 20-26 of the Phoenix City Code and establishing an effective date. Thank you. Uh, we have significant members of the public to provide comment to the city on this item, so I will turn to our city staff to call those members of the public. Thank you, Mayor. Our first speaker is Gail Knight. Gail, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, and City Administration. After 20 years of advocacy and participating on various City of Phoenix Police Community Relations Committees, I wholeheartedly support the formal approval of the rules to create the Office of Accountability and Transparency Ordinance. I believe this is a groundbreaking step in the right direction to ensure citizen protection, improve police community relations and trust. It is important to note that my support is not out of hate for the police, as I had many relatives, both male and female, that are veterans or current public safety officers in cities throughout the United States. This ordinance will ensure that all complaints about the use of force in custody deaths and other matters of public interest are fairly and objectively resolved through an independent, professional, and transparent review process. I also appreciate the time, research, and many public hearings that have occurred between police, city, I'm, so, I'm sorry, between Phoenix City Council, administration, and residents. Thank you for hanging in there during these challenging times to reach this goal. Greatly appreciate it. Our next speaker is Dr. Warren Stewart. Dr. Warren, are you on the line? I'm on the line, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Diego, Okay, Mayor Diego and Phoenix City Council members, thank you for this opportunity to speak in favor of item 89. After a decades-long advocacy, 
in February 2020, the Phoenix City Council voted to approve establishing the Office of Accountability and Transparency. The African American Christian Clergy Coalition celebrated this long sought victory for the entire city of Phoenix. Please know that African American clergy have had a respectful, productive, and amicable relationship with the Phoenix Police Department for the 44 years I have served as senior pastor of the First Institutional Baptist Church. We have had a working relationship with every Phoenix police chief. Therefore, we envision the Office of Accountability and Transparency as a significant and strategic step toward enhancing the relationship between Phoenix police and all communities and neighborhoods within the city of Phoenix, especially communities of color. With that being said, I strongly urge you, Mayor Gallego and Phoenix City Council members to vote in favor of item 89. Thank you very much and may God bless you. Our next speaker is Katie Beza. Katie, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry, I think I just lost you. We can hear you. Please proceed. Katie, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'm sorry, I thought I lost you. I keep hearing a beeping in my ear. Okay, sorry. Um, my story is only one example of why you should approve moving forward with this item. You may recall the city paid out $3 million in the wrongful death of my brother, Ryan Whitaker, by the hands of Phoenix police officer, Jeff Cook. 363 days later, there has been zero accountability for that officer, as well as his partner, who demonstrated a severe lack of value for the sanctity of life that night, as he ignored my brother's struggles to cling to life. We were lied to from day one and ignored as they edited their body cam videos and redacted their reports until they were finally released to us months later. I was told there was an internal investigation done by the Phoenix Police Department. My family was never given any information regarding that investigation. We did not receive any communication nor a report of any kind. I would still like to know, were, those, were both officers investigated? Was a detective who lied to my mother the morning she told her my brother was killed investigated? I have no idea because the police department has not been transparent. The county attorney failed and did not press charges on the officer that killed my brother, however, did release the reports of the investigation. Although I feel the investigation was not thorough enough and very biased, at least we received a report. In her statement, Ryan was cleared of any wrongdoing and she states, although in hindsight, the officer's actions were probably not the right ones, they weren't unlawful, according to her. How does a quote unquote mistake that costs a human life just get let go with no repercussions? not even an apology. I can only imagine the Phoenix Police Department's investigations of their own are as biased or even more biased as the one I read from the county attorney's office. This is why we need independent investigations and oversight of the internal investigations. We need communication with families and the community. I do not think it is understood how the betrayal of a department that is supposed to protect and serve affects an entire family, community, and generation we need accountability and independent investigation so the police are no longer policing themselves as one positive step towards change and trust in the community. Thank you. Mayor, may I ask a question of Katie? Please do, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Katie, thank you for continuing to advocate, um, not only for your family, but I know you're, you're working with other families. Um, can you speak a little bit more of, of to what your experience was like during the investigation? Um, did you have conversations with, with the department or, or how was that? Or how did you feel about the investigation when it happened? Or how was your family impacted by it? Um, I would say when we were, what we were told um, at the very beginning was not what we witnessed on body cam or nor the public witness on body cam. So I felt we felt lied to from day one, as I said, in what I was saying earlier. Um, 
But as far as the investigation goes, we were not kept up to date. We were not given any information. Um, we would email and call and get nothing. I have an email right here from to Chief Williams and the detective on the case, Detective Lord from my father on June 6th, still pleading for information. Um, and all he got was um, an email back saying that someone would contact us, which no one ever did. So it was, we got a phone call. Um, we got an email stating the investigation was complete and has been turned over to the Maricopa County's attorney's office and an OIS video will be released in 20 minutes. Have a nice day. <laughs> That's as much communication as we got. Thank you. Final question and don't feel pressure to answer, but is there things you wish we would have been able to do different through the process or are there suggestions or thoughts you may have of us as we move, hopefully move forward with this office? How long do you have? Um, honestly, you know, like you said, I, I do meet with other family members and we all have the same story. Um, it's just a continuation every time of the same story, it seems. And um, honesty, communication, letting us know, even if it's, even even if it's not much information or you seem it seems irrelevant we're a family that is grieving and shocked to our core and just want to know what's going on um communication just goes a very long way um it was a struggle to get my brother's body released um he was killed on a thursday night my parents didn't get to see him until the following Tuesday. Um, it was, it, everything has been a struggle. So, you know, just, you never know what you know until you know it, obviously. And we had no idea what to ask, what to do, who to go to, anything. And so, you know, what I, I hope for in the future is some sort of advocate that reaches out to the families and can and can communicate and be that in between that helps families know where to go and what to do um, because it's an awful awful process right now because we're treated as um, we're not treated as a victim or the victim's family because our our loved ones are never listed as the victim so um, that's there's I could. <laughs> It's just, um, I don't know what else to say. I lost my train of thought, but I appreciate you asking me questions and letting me speak. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I think hopefully in the future, we're able to engage families like yourselves to make sure that we're, we're serving you better. But thank you for testifying today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Murphy Bannerman. Murphy, are you on the line? Uh, yes. Um, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak today. I'm speaking today um, just as a Phoenix resident um, and absolutely urge that the council um, passes uh, the OAT. Uh, it has been a long process and it's incredibly important that we have um, some kind of oversight of our police um, in the city of Phoenix. It, it's really only a matter of time before another shooting occurs, before another uh, family um, life is disrupted by you know, violence um, by the Phoenix Police Department. And that is why we need to have this to actually be um, able to hold those individuals accountable um, for their actions. Um, it also, I will say it is a bit disappointing that the OAT will not allow for independent investigations. Um, that is really going to limit the ability for this program to be the most effective that it could possibly be. 
However, this is still a step that needs to be taken so that we can have some semblance of justice um, for the families that have been hurt and the families that honestly will be hurt in the future by our uh, police department. So thank you, and I hope the council passes us. Our next speaker is Kat Blue. Kat, are you on the line? I am. An Office of Accountability and Transparency is very much needed and must have the power to conduct independent investigation. But it is not enough still to stop the death and destruction caused by Phoenix police. This measure can be put in place as you begin divesting from police and investing in community. Additional funding, despite ongoing protests, will never make your police function for the good of the community. Their function is to violently and discriminatorily enforce the law to keep wealthy white elites in power. So further funding serves only to further this function. The proposed budget is an attack on black, indigenous, people of color and supporters. A disciplinary measure punishing us for protesting the generation's long war on black and brown bodies, for daring to demand you defund and divest from police and facilitate an egalitarian society. It throws the power of government and its enforcers, the police, in our faces in direct response to our calls to transfer funding from police to community. OAT, CAP, and other programs must work separately from and most instead of law enforcement. We must replace your law enforcement agency. We call on you to fully fund and create both an OAT and alternative crisis response systems now. Move funds from the police budget to entities to replace and hold them accountable. The Office of Accountability and Transparency is a small piece of the solution and must have sufficient power and independence and funding to perform its role. Use the people's budget as an example. Fund the community and not the police. Hear us now. Keep your law enforcement agency from abusing the community and the people you serve. Shame on all of you who support additional funding for law enforcement against the wishes of your constituents. Fire Phoenix PD or Phoenix will fire you. Please order the immediate release of all records and body cam footage from all officers present at the tasing of baby Luna and her father who was compliant and in need of help. Please assist us expeditiously and wholeheartedly seeking justice by making this the first case to be investigated by the OAT. Our next speaker is Sandra Castro Solis. Sandra, are you on the line? Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and the rest of the council staff. Um, my name is Sandra Castro Solis and I am representing Puente Movement. Um, we've been around in the community since 2007. And I think it's important that we start there because since 2007, we've been fighting police um, policing and the use of force and violent aggression of police towards black, brown and indigenous communities. Um, I'm, we as an organization are full in support of Oak. Like many of the other community members, we also feel um, it's a, a step in the right direction. However, it is not the end all be on for accountability and justice to the communities, to the victims and the families who have lost loved ones due to police violence. Um, our work specifically, I'm here to talk specifically around police conduct in regards to racial profiling, um, after SB 1070. And it's important to note that myself and a lot of the colleagues and a lot of the community members here today, we've been doing a lot of work to keep Phoenix Police Department um, accountable on their racial profiling after the passage of SB 1070. And to this day, we still have high drastic numbers of 95% of people um, being racially profiled by police. If we don't have this problem continuing, we have um, community members profiled and killed by Phoenix police, making Phoenix police one of the most violent um, police agencies. And if we don't have that, we have policy errors where police is, no, is unable to follow their own policy, which leads us time and time again to these meetings. And so we're here in support of this. You know, we need an office that's going to hold our community, uh, who's gonna give a voice to our community and hold police officers ac ac accountable when they are wrong. And we have record to show that they are wrong over and over again. And we need an office to help us and support and hear the stories and investigate to bring justice to these community members. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Katie Gibson McLean. Katie, are you on the line? Yes. Hi, my name is Katie Gibson McLean. I'm a District 8 resident. I was on the city's ad hoc review and implementation committee. I also served on the committee, a coalition of folks who helped develop the proposal for the Office of Accountability and Transparency. I'm also a public defender for Maricopa County, and I see abuses of power, use of excessive force, and all kinds of violations of operations orders on a daily basis when I read reports and watch body cam footage. As an attorney that was assigned recently to the protest case where my client, Mr. Ryder Collins, was wrongfully accused and has since had his record expunged, there are 14 officers who've been put on administrative leave resulting in their misconduct or as a result of some other issue um, regarding that case or other actions around that case. I think that plus the story that just came out even last night from Dave Biscabing regarding um, lying and falsifying in police reports and testimony about accusations that were putting someone, trying to keep someone in custody, is all the evidence you need to know that even when someone's not dying at the hands of police, there's plenty that's going on that needs to be reviewed and there needs to be an outlet for that. Suing the city or saying qualified immunity needs to be abolished is one thing, but you know that goes to like financial <laughs> concerns, not actual accountability and actual change. None of that's gonna happen um, if we don't have an oat and if we don't have an oat that has teeth. And I'm really just, I'm just getting tired of having clients who are mistreated and seeing the abuses of power by Phoenix police and knowing that there's no outlet for that to be um, reckoned with. I, I would urge each and every one of you to take this opportunity to devote yes. There's nothing bad that can come of this. We are the largest city in the U.S. without this type of office. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeremy Helfgott. Jeremy, are you on the line? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, Jeremy Helfgott, a resident of District 1 and proud to serve on the City's Human Relations Commission and previously on the Community Police Trust Initiative Task Force. I'm here today to urge you to finally implement this action today and stand up the Office of Accountability and Transparency as those bodies and others in the city have been asking for for more than a decade. I've spent the, se the past seven years immersed in trying to build relationships between the community of Phoenix and our police department, which is also part of our community. And I really wanna strongly echo, and not for the first time, what Pastor Dr. Stewart said. There is interest in working with everybody here, but trust and accountability to be effective have to be mutual. I, I've had folks on the other side of this, particularly officers say to me, how would you like it if somebody stepped in and placed people who don't know your business in charge of the way you do your business. And my answer is simple. If the authority, the money, the equipment, and everything I need operationally to do my business is being provided by those people, then I don't have much of an argument against oversight by those people. And that's where we are here today. As has already been mentioned, we are the fifth largest city in this country, and we are quote unquote, leading from behind on this matter. It's time to create the accountability and transparency that the community has been calling for. And in so doing, finally move forward on increasing and rebuilding the trust that we need mutually amongst ourselves and our police officers. I thank you very much. I encourage each of you to vote yes today. Thank you, Council Member Garcia for your leadership on this. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Our next speaker is Anna Hernandez. Anna, are you on the line? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, my name is Anna Hernandez, resident of District 4. 
born and raised city of Phoenix, and I'm here speaking because, again, because this is something that has become a very important piece uh, for my family and myself, um, as we have personal experience with losing a loved one at the hands of police violence. Um, I still don't understand why this is such a fight. This is, we're not asking for anything groundbreaking. We're not asking for anything that doesn't make sense. We're asking for there to be an independent body that reviews when errors are made because those errors result in murder. And that's a fact. My brother's death certificate is listed as a homicide. Why? Because he was shot five times by a Phoenix police officer. He was handcuffed and he was let a canine go upon him with no help to save his life. He bled out on a dirt ground. So when things like that happen, that's not, it doesn't stop there. It continues when us as a family want to know why that happened and we get no answers. Every way we turn, we're hit with the roadblock from trying to obtain reports, from trying to obtain information on what happened, from trying to obtain their belongings. It continues and it continues with no answers. You know, I, I lost my brother, my little brother, to an epidemic of police shootings. Less than two years later, I had to bury my dad as a loss to COVID, and I wasn't able to get him answers before he left. And that's something that I can never fix because there is no body that will give us the answers that we need. I also would like to know why the revised version of this wasn't posted for us to review on the agenda, because I know that there is a revised version that is circulating, and that's what I would encourage everybody to vote for. Thank you. Mayor, may I ask some questions? Vice Mayor, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for, and I know it's hard every time you have to talk about it, and I'm sorry for the loss of your, your, your father as well. I, I remember when your parents came in, I think I was a month into office, and, and they just wanted answers. Um, and like you said, we were never able to give it to them. Can, can you speak a little bit more to how long it took to receive police reports, body cam, um, medical exams, or, or the belongings of your brother? Uh, yeah, I can actually. So it, it was a fight. It was a hard battle. It took us um, about three months to obtain a, poli a public records request for the police report. Um, and that was only after I advocated, I protested, I spoke at different events, at different community meetings. Um, I had to speak to the mayor and to the chief at events they were at in order to try to obtain that. So it took us about three months to try to get the report to this day, which has been over two years, um, just over two years. I don't have a medical examiner's report. The hospital records that we were able to obtain, we only obtained them because um, my sister's a nurse and was smart enough to go to the hospital and request that. So we were able to get um, the hospital records, the ambulance report, the paramedics report through the hospital because she was smart enough to think of that. How about your brother's belongings? Were, were you able to get those? I know last time we spoke, you, you still weren't able to get them. No, no, to this day. Um, and that's the other part, right, that is very frustrating because the lack of acknowledgement from the assigned detective, um, we've, I've had communication with her a couple of times, maybe three times in total in two years. Um, I'm actually trying to work on getting his belongings now and I go it's unacknowledged. I send emails with no responses. Um, I have to add the city manager to emails, the chief of police to emails to try to even to even get an acknowledgement. So two years later, and I'm still trying to fight to get my brother's belongings. So this is this is what's really happening. This is what these families, including mine, are really experiencing that nobody takes into account. During the, the investigation, were you able to get, like, did you get updates? How, how were you notified? Did you know when the investigation ended? How was that process for you? It's been very, very frustrating because 
with the day the incident happened, um, there was two police officers stationed at my parents' house so that we didn't leave to the scene because I had already been at the scene. And we actually found out that he died through media because somebody in the police department leaked it to the media that he died. So instead of hearing, being informed as probably their procedure is by an officer or a detective, we had to learn it, learn of it by a alert on my sister's phone that our little brother had died. Um, there was, other than that, there was no communication that a couple of detectives spoke to us the day of, um, they said they would reach out again in three days. And now it's two years later and nobody has reached out. Um, so as you can imagine, we, we don't know anything, right? I didn't know when the investigation was handed over to the county attorney um, through resources of our own, of us families that have tried to do the work to find out answers, we were able to get a link to the county attorney's website where it shows that my brother's case was cleared. Um, but nobody ever to this day has communicated that to us. Um, so everything I know to this day is because I have fought to try to obtain answers instead of the department that is supposed to help with that treats us like we don't matter. You don't mind, I want to ask you a couple more questions and feel free also to not answer if, 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 if it, it's okay. But I, I remember conversations um, about the, the funeral service and some of the barriers that you all faced when, when it all happened. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and like your personal experience with that? Um, well, I don't know if I can have the words to explain exactly what it's like to plan the funeral services of the youngest child in our family as that kind of fell on my shoulders. Um, but it was very difficult, right? It was very difficult because as you're trying to plan funeral services, you're trying to obtain answers. For us, because we reacted in the moment, we were able to know where he was what hospital he was taken to, but we weren't able to see him until the funeral home had him because nobody communicated with us that the medical examiner had to pick him up because there was an officer involved shooting. Um, but, you know, we, we were able to get everything done. But then you have families like James Garcia's family that have him listed as a John Doe and the family couldn't get answers where he was, what happened to him. And even now that we're trying to obtain belongings, you have people like James that are listed as John Doe's. And that just keeps these roadblocks in place, you know, for us that we're trying to find some healing and find some, some closure, some answers, and it just continues. Last, last two questions. How do you feel you were you were treated by the department? And do you feel your experience, now that you've connected with other families, does it feel like you've all had a similar experience? Yeah, I mean, in speaking to some of the other families that I, I talk to all the time, um, the, sim the, the experiences are very similar. The treatment has been pretty simil similar across the board, um, especially considering some of us have the same detective assigned to our cases. Um, I feel like we were treated very wrong. Um, you know, from the very beginning, they ran with a certain narrative to try to put protection in place for their, for their officers. They spoke to us hours, I mean, within an hour or two from killing my brother, right? Because that's what's listed on his death certificate is a homicide, which means that they murdered him. Um, within within minutes, you know, a couple hours after that, you're you're talking to the family, but you're not really giving us. They were asking questions that were very leading, um, and then putting stuff in the report that wasn't accurate, and then we're left with no outlet to de to um, debate what's in the report because we are not kept in the loop during the investigation process. 
So how is this, how does this make sense that if an officer can get information from the investigation and they can change their story or, or clear up comments or statements they made, how is it that the family of somebody that they, that they just killed isn't extended the same courtesy when there's things in our report that are a lie, like blatantly are a lie. And so that treatment is just it's very disheartening. It makes it made us feel and continue to make make our family feel like our brother's life didn't matter and that he's just another statistic to this to the city. Last thing, I asked Katie the same thing, and, and I know, and, you know, you mentioned some of this earlier, and I'm not expecting to take too much more of your time and everybody else watching, but I think it's important, and I think the reason this makes sense is, is to make sure that other families don't go through what you all have gone through. Are there some other things you think we should add to this process or, or ways you wish it would have been different for you and your family? Um, I mean, there's so many ways that it could have been different um, that I don't think this is, I don't have the time to talk about, like Katie said, how much time do we have? But ultimately, you know, we need to build better communities uh, to make our people healthier and give them a chance of survival. Um, but in specifics to this process, um, what I read in the agenda is not what we need. What we need is a revised proposal that does include independent investigation. Like, that has to be a non-negotiable because anything else is basically the same thing we have upheld in place now, which is putting a, a, a job in front of – that a job is worth more than the sanctity of human life, right? Or any incident that happens, any experience from a, from a, from a human being and from a member of this community – so I think without that, the thing that I wish was different is that had something like this been in place when this happened to us, we would probably have more answers. And maybe when I buried my dad, I would have been able to do it with him knowing why this happened and if it could have been avoided. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Kelly. Michael, are you on the line? I am, and thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and Phoenix City Council members. My name is Michael Kelly. I'm a District 8 resident. As a recipient of a City of Phoenix Excellence Award for Community-Based Policing, a graduate of the FBI Citizens Academy, and two-time participant in the Phoenix uh, Police Department Citizen Policy, uh, Police Academy, I have firsthand knowledge of the challenges citizens and law enforcement face on a regular basis. Over many years, I've taken the time to read the reports from the Disciplinary Review Board and Department's Use of Force Board, of which many dedicated Phoenix residents participated, like Gail Knight and Dr. Ann Hart and Kurt Mangum, just to name a few. Many of these recommendations have been implemented by Phoenix PD, but there is obviously much more work to be done. In August of 2019, thank you, Mayor Gallego, for uh, putting together an ad hoc committee to implement long-stalled police reforms. Now, I attended these meetings where committee members reviewed best practices from other police departments and vociferously debated a plethora of important issues. In 2020, the Phoenix City Council voted to create and fund the Office of Accountability and Transparency, and yesterday we took progressive steps in police reform to recommend adding resources to the Community Assistance Program, or CAP program, at the fire department. Special thanks to Vice Mayor Garcia and other supportive council members for your leadership regarding this action. And these and other reasons are why I support council action to adopt the governing language for the OAT by creating a new chapter 20 of the Phoenix City Code and the establishment of an effective date. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Michael Ochoa. Michael, are you on the line? Uh, yes. Are you able to hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can. Thank you. Please proceed. Good afternoon, City Council members and others. My name is Michael Angel Ochoa. I'm a United States Army veteran. And I completely, well, to a degree, I'm in support of accountability and transparency for law enforcement. I think uh, this is the right step. As small as it is, it is the right step uh, to make sure that our police are properly trained and educated before they hit the streets. A police officer should not be able to break a person's leg without any provocation or need of escalation and face no consequence. A police officer should not be able to kidnap a person in downtown Phoenix to drug and stick in a mental facility for convenience without consequence. A police officer should not be able to arrest individuals with lack of evidence and lack of witnesses. Protesting must be protected, not persecuted. The city of Phoenix is in dire need of police accountability and transparency. The corruption is rampant and the officials are dormant. Present company included. Square yourselves away, city of Phoenix. Please do right by your people, not your pockets. Please pray for me, and I'll pray for you. And uh, I, I recently got arrested by City of Phoenix Police Department for false charges. They've lied on the police report. The public defendant's office has been has been anything but helpful, and. This seems to be just a growing trend in the city that needs to be addressed. Please take uh, the voice of your citizens as fuel to continue on the right path. And thank you for your time. Nice. Our next speaker is Mukhtar Sheikh. Mukhtar, are you on the line? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Mokhtar Sheikh, and I'm a community advocate here that works with refugee and immigrant and larger community. I'm called to support the Office of Accountability and Transparency. We need this office to build better community policing. The city council have heard many community members complain about harmful policing and police department have failed to address complaints and concerns. We need this office so our community member have an independent, separate office from the police department. We are not against police officers. We just need better policing, better communication from police, and hold police officers that harass and harm our community accountable. We need oversight, accountability, and transparency. I'd like to ask the mayor and the city council member to establish this office, and for the first time in 100 years, to have a police um, police office and police departments that work for the community, not against the community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Sticht. Christine, are you on the line? Christine is not on the line. Our next speaker is Jennifer Underwood. Jennifer, are you on the line? Jennifer is not on the line. Our next speaker is Whitney Walker. Whitney, are you on the line? Yes, I am here. Thank you, okay. please proceed. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, M Mayor Gallego and members of council. Um, I am Whitney Walker, the Vice President of Public Policy Advocacy and Organizing with Planned Parenthood of Arizona and also the executive director of our political and social arm of Planned Parenthood Advocates of Arizona. I come to you today, as you all may be aware, that Planned Parenthood Arizona serves countless number of Phoenix residents each year. 
PPAZ care for, our, for the patients extends beyond the doors of its clinics. The harmful impact of overcriminalization and policing of communities impedes on an individual's ability to seek the care they need at Planned Parenthood clinics. As organizations like PPAZ seek to provide the support and resources needed to ensure everyone has the ability to create the family and the community they desire to thrive in, we call on our elected officials to do the same. While we appreciate the City of Phoenix passing the Office of Accountability and Transparency policy last year, it is beyond time to enact the policy into the city ordinance. There has been one shooting after another, after another, with little to no justice for families or the communities that they try to survive in and thrive in every single day. Systemic racism exists in every part of our society, unfortunately and we know that it is most evident in policing. For decades, it has been reported that Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color are shot at higher rates than our white community members, specifically reported in the Arizona Republic last year of saying, Phoenix officers most awfully use deadly force in majority Black and brown communities. A fact that is no surprise to Black, Indigenous, people of color in the city of Phoenix. Thank you to the elected officials who are taking time to address the trauma inflicted in the city of Phoenix and taking action to look for accountability for any misconduct. This all is only a foundational step in the larger collective goal of ensuring. Our next speaker is Reginald Walton. Reginald, are you on the line? I am. Thank you so very much. Um, I've been a Phoenix resident since August 22nd of 2012. I rode my U-Haul van into the city and became the senior pastor of the Phillips Memorial CME Church. I have lost count of the amount of times that I have come to the city council to speak on policing issues. I've lost count of the number of families that we've gone and prayed with over police brutality and police violence. I have lost count of the number of times that we've held town halls, vigils, and marches calling on transparency in this city. It is high time for the city of Phoenix, this city that is named after the mythical creature that rises from the ashes, this city that is the fifth largest city in the United States of America, it is time to lead. I'm thankful to the mayor, to the vice mayor, and to those who are courageous enough to vote for the people. And lastly, understand this. This is not an attack on policing. This is a tool to allow police and community to build trust. This is a tool that will help people to articulate and understand that they have some place where their voices can be heard, where they will not be derided, where they will not be belittled. Lastly, law enforcement is supposed to protect and serve. And when you protect, you do no harm. When you serve, you serve all of the people, regardless of race, creed, or color. And lastly, you do not lie and make up trumped up charges against peaceful protesters. And so I urge you, I beg you to please vote yes. Our next speaker is Janelle Wood. Janelle, are you on the line? Janelle is not on the line. Our next speaker is Brett Aldiri. Brett, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please proceed. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mayor and City Councilman. Uh, thanks for the ability to speak. Um, lived in uh, Arizona for 34 years, almost all that time in Phoenix. Um, my view is that the Phoenix PD is one of the better police departments in our country. Um, I've met with and, and highly respect the leadership that Chief Williams has brought in her command team. I can tell you that our community always turns out very big to support our police department. 
very supportive of their efforts and what they do every day. I stand today to voice opposition to the OAT concept. While I'll definitely acknowledge that Phoenix PD is not perfect, I don't know of an organization that is. It pays a lot of attention to our communities and issues, and I have confidence Chief Williams and Internal Affairs does a good job. I, I believe that spending $3 million of taxpayer funds on an OAT concept is a, is a bit of a waste of money. I think these funds could be better spent to put more police officers on the street where they're needed and to provide more enhanced police training so that we have better trained police officers. Watching what happens after the fact, I think is, uh, is just a misplace. I would say let's be smarter on how we spend precious taxpayer funds. And then last, I would say our police men and women stand up for us every single day. I think today it's time for us to stand up for our police department. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Cavassi. Sandra, are you on the line? Sandra is not on the line. Our next speaker is Marsha Florian. Marsha, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you, please proceed. Yes. Mayor and members of the city council, <clears throat> I had surgery, a little scratchy voice. I am a native of Phoenix and um, a lifetime supporter of the Phoenix Police Department. I live here because we have a safe community. We have had a well governed community and city. In the past, we've had one of the best run cities in the world. And it's been an honor to be a citizen in that type of a city. Over the last couple of years, I've seen the uh, city council support for our police department uh, diminish. It causes me a great deal of concern. Uh, I believe that having done some research on the police department and understanding how their uh, internal investigations works and their use of force board and the numbers of things that they have done to be innovative and inclusive of the citizens of Phoenix in their uh, activities exceeds many police departments across the country. I also know that those other cities that are larger than the city of Phoenix who have enacted ex external programs to investigate or oversee the police department have not been successful in making any effective change. I agree with the last speaker who said, this is a huge amount of money that is going to do little if nothing for the citizens of Phoenix. And I think that you need to listen to your citizens and the majority of the people, although you stacked a number of people who support this, I went through every comment on the comment section that were people writing about this pro this proposal. And the majority of the comments were in, opposi were in opposition of the OAT, the Office of Transparency. So I urge you to vote no on this pro proposition. I urge that you do not create a new office. You do not create any more legislation. Our next speaker is Diane Galati. Diane, are you on the line? Diane is not on the line. Our next speaker is Barbara Jennings. Barbara, are you on the line? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I also oppose this proposition. Um, I appreciate you taking the time and, and allowing me to speak, but first and foremost, I think we need to stop ridiculing and persecuting the men and women that risk their lives on a daily basis for our safety and security. The false ideology that has spread across the country that the police and our country, for that matter, is systematically racist, is divisive, harmful, and undermining our state's and nation's safety and security. Our border is under siege and is being controlled by the drug cartels who are greatly profiting from their drug and human trafficking operations. I was listening to Congress today and there was more fentanyl brought into our country this month than all of 2020. If anything, our city council should be spending this money to hire more policemen, especially 
in our poor communities. Those of you who represent those communities are not considering the safety of your constituents. We have no idea how great the challenges will be to our state's security and profitability as people are allowed to freely enter unchecked. We don't need a group of people looking over our policemen's shoulders, analyzing their every move. We already have cameras that monitor their actions. We need to utilize that money to support our police. In Arizona, our violent crime rate is higher than the national average. In fact, in Phoenix, your chance of becoming a victim of a violent crime is one in 142. It is not rocket science to see the outcome of defunding the police. All we have to do is look at Portland, Seattle, New York City, Chicago, and many more blue cities where crime is skyrocketing. Our state relies on tourism. People and businesses will not want to visit or locate here if our state isn't safe. I don't, I don't understand why this is even being considered. We already know the outcome will be detrimental. Very scary if our policies chase away good officers and make becoming a police officer an undesirable occupation in Arizona. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Krista Leong. Krista, are you on the line? I am. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I would like to say that I sympathize with those who have had bad experiences with law enforcement and are looking for justice and for transparency. I am a longtime resident of the city of Phoenix. I've been here for 20 years. I moved from the West. I was drawn to this city. Um, but in this case, I must ask how will we be sure? And an alternative office will be impartial and fair to both the citizens as well as to the law enforcement officers and provide them due process. How will we be sure that the folks that will be hired in this office of accountability and transparency will be looking out for the best for our city and making sure that our officers have due process and are protected? I agree with the other people that have spoken and said that our officers are being maligned. And I know that there are bad apples in every bunch. But that doesn't make it true across the board. And I respect those officers who put their lives on the line for us. I mean, I'm trying to raise a family in this city and I and I realize that it's becoming more dangerous. We've had incidences a mile away from my home. I live in a safe community and I need our, our law enforcement to be around to protect us. So I respectfully request that the city council look to other cities who have not supported their law enforcement and have moved to defund the police or, or cause them injustice and see what's been happening. Violent crime, murders, shootings, burglaries have skyrocketed. Nobody wants to visit those cities. The previous person who said Phoenix is a tourist city. If it is not safe to come here, no one will come here. No one will want to live here. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Justin McKay. Justin, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please proceed. So I oppose this measure. Uh, the idea for this uh, oversight office is it's too underdeveloped and it lacks standards uh, regarding who can serve in the office. The main standard is that one can't be law enforcement or or have family that was law enforcement. Uh, why sh why should that be the only standard? Why not also have residency requirements or education requirements? Um, sure, you want to exclude people connected to law enforcement to avoid pro police bias. I understand that, but wouldn't it be just as important to exclude people affiliated with? Uh, explicit anti-police groups to avoid anti-police bias. Uh, yes, of course I would. Um, there, there's also no standards to judge whether the office uh, is successful or not. So without more standards, it's just destined to become a menace to the police and by extension, a menace to the public. So for that reason, the council should immediately discontinue this program until it's further developed. Thanks. Our next speaker is Kathy Nolte. Kathy, are you on the line? Kathy is not on the line. Our next speaker is Linda Perky. Linda, are you on the line? Linda is not on the line. Our next speaker is Robert Ritter. 
Robert, are you on the line? Robert is not on the line. Our next speaker is Janine Rodriguez. Janine, are you on the line? I am on the line. Thank you, please proceed. Can you hear me? Thank you. Good afternoon, mayor and council members. I'm Janine Rodriguez and a 24 year resident of District 8. Can you imagine in 2021 an agenda item in front of this council that has language that discriminates against you based on who you love or who is in your family? It's shocking. 20-5 subsection D disallows immediate family members of former or current law enforcement agencies from holding a position oh. in open. If this council allows for this type of discrimination in a city ordinance, what is next? This is a slippery slope in the definition of prejudice. It is concerning that such language has been written into this ordinance. It seems the drafters don't want members in the oath with diverse backgrounds and experiences. Rather, they want to exclude some members of the public based on their family, something they have no control over. I myself hold a Bachelor of Science in Administration of Justice from Arizona State. This degree focused on initial police contact through adjudication in the courts. It required over 100 hours of police ride-alongs, one week at the academy, and a nine-month internship at the Maricopa County Justice Courts. I have also over a decade in criminal defense. Yet this ordinance says I need not apply for the OAT because I have an immediate family member in law enforcement. What, or better yet, who does it serve to disallow someone like me in the community from applying for a position in OAT? What are they trying to hide? Why discriminate against someone based on their family? Who is next? What ordinance will be next? No Italians in the parks or rec department? Only people with purple hair at the parks on Wednesday? For, this or for an ordinance that is being boasted as creating transparency, it sure seems like they are starting off with something to hide. This agenda item discriminates against me and countless others in our city who would be qualified to apply. Vote no on agenda item 89. The city of Phoenix does not support discrimination and should not pass an ordinance that has it written in it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Schultz. Michael, are you on the line? Michael is not on the line. Our next speaker is Jane Siebold. Jane, are you on the line? I'm on the line and thank you. Good afternoon, city council members. Um, let me be straight up front, I'm going on 89. The reason I'm now on 89 is because it undermines the police who enforce the Constitution, which every one of you took the oath to protect and defend. Granted, the police aren't perfect, but, and transparent, as we would all like them to be, but we're, neither are the government officials as we're currently experiencing. So if we were to do an oversight, it would have to be across the board. What I'm deeply concerned about is not only that they are the enforcers of the Constitution, but the ability for anti-police advocates who are targeting them and also but it's a discrimination not only against the police and uh, members of the police families, but it's also getting racial. And so what I'm suggesting is in the course of this, I read uh, Mayor Gallego's uh, quote that it's um, a racial bias that's been going on for years. Well, let's hear about some solutions. This is not a solution. This is a this is kind of like a targeting. And so I'm looking for you leaders to lead to actually find solutions that will benefit everyone to bring us together in unity and not continue to separate us or continue to stir, stir the pot. Police, for the most part, they're going to be the ones that you call in the event of an accident or a home robbery. So I would like to see what they do as good, you know, as opposed to hearing just all the bad. You know, not everybody's bad. But I do expect that you consider it that once Portland stopped funding the police, 2,000% increase in homicides. So going back to it, if you vote yes, you're undermining the Constitution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janelle Wood. Janelle, are you on the line? I am on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please proceed. All right. 
Yes, thank you so much. My name is Janelle Wood, and I am the president of the Black Mothers Forum. And I wanted to share my show my support uh, for um, item number 89 for the ordinance, uh, Chapter 20, for the Office of Accountability and Transparency. Uh, I have listened to many of the the um, opposing uh, comments, and one of the things that I have to say is that when when people don't experience the type of traumas that our community has experienced at the hands of some of the officers, we're not, not saying that all the officers are um, have a problem, but those particular officers that have been, behaved in a way that is traumatized or even killed our sons and daughters, we need to make sure that we are reviewing their records, we are investigating this misconduct, and we have a mechanism to do that. And this department will do that for us, and that will create greater trust in the community. So I am in support of this, and I am encouraging and urging every last one of our council members to support this and vote yes on this ordinance. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Marcus Tork. Marcus, are you on the line? Marcus is not on the line. Our next speaker is John Yoder. John, are you on the line? John is not on the line. Our next speaker is Viridiana Hernandez. Viridiana, are you on the line? Yes. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Um, some of these comments are really ridiculous. Uh, the, this department is one of the most violent and racist departments, and this office will not stop that. This office will not stop the killing of people. The stories, you know, we heard two stories right now and, and the questions that were asked. This is just two examples of the countless families that this is exactly what they have to go through. There's not, there is everything that is currently set up is to protect this department. People are at, talking about being impartial. There's nothing impartial about the current process. There's nothing just about the current process. It is disgusting to hear some of these comments, uh, right, when people are, are suddenly talking about how do we prove success, right? This department has been overfunded for the last 10 years, while every other department in the city has been defunded. When youth programs had a budget of over 4 million about 10 years ago, and right now still have a budget that is just at 2 million. Where transportation is inaccessible, you name it, whatever it is. And yet crimes have gone up, people do not feel safe, and this department is getting almost $800 million and the vast majority of our general funds. And it is gross to think that yesterday, Mayor Gallo, you voted to continue to fund and have 191 vacant positions that are there. So people want to talk about where the money is at. It's right there. It is 191 vacant positions that have not been filled since 2018. That is where funding is. Move that funding into our community. So here talking about oh, oh, needs to pass if it is investigative. And if it includes the families in the development process. Mayor, that was our final request to speak on this item. Wonderful. Thank you. I will turn to our vice mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and, and to everyone who came out to speak today. Mayor, on a motion to approve the Office of Accountability and Transparency per the revised ordinance that was submitted to your office along with all the council offices and staff on Monday, May 17th. Second. We have a motion and a second. Council member comments. Mayor. Councilwoman Gustavo, followed by Councilwoman Ansari. Thank you. Yes, I will be um, supporting this motion. I also want to direct um, the city manager to ensure that a family advocate is promptly hired after the old director is in place. Officer involved shootings and use of force incidents can be traumatic for families and for the community, especially when children are involved. 
The family advocate should take a caseworker approach by supporting families throughout the aftermath of a critical incident. The family advocate should have counseling experience and be able to provide mental health and other resources to impacted community members. They should also act as the main point of contact and facilitate communication between the department and families involved in critical incidents. And, and this this one is it is especially important to me um, on July 4th of last year, um, one of our Cartwright school board members um, lost her son at hand of police. And I know that she and I went back and forth. Um, she had no idea where to go, what to do, who to talk to, um, to get it to get information. And as she was heartbroken of what had happened to her um, between the two of us, we were trying to figure out how to get information, how she could get his belongings. Um, it, it, it's something that I think as a city, we can do a little a little better about this and hopefully um, we can we can make this happen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, firstly, I just wanna thank um, all of the community members that have called in today. Um, many of you, discuss how you've been working on this for decades, um, probably longer than I've been alive. Thank you to the council members who have been leading this effort for the past year, uh, council member Garcia and his entire team who have been working so, so hard to make this a reality. And um, I feel proud that this is one of the first votes I'll be able to make. Um, I just wanna say, you know, the reasons why I'm supportive of the Office of Accountability and Transparency we are one of the only major cities in the United States without any sort of civilian oversight of our police department. Um, this is really important. I think today, by voting for this, we're showing that we believe in transparency, we believe in accountability, and we're also showing that we believe in data. Um, I've looked into data from other cities uh, going back many years, cities that have similar offices, and they've been successful. They have helped in many cases to then develop policies that have reduced officer involved shootings or instances of violence in the long run. And that's why another reason why this is so important. It's about the data. It's about learning um, from instances that happen and it's about transparency. On top of the pandemic last year, uh, 2020 exposed a lot of systems. Uh, that have primarily impacted communities of color. So I'm really glad that Phoenix is choosing to respond with thoughtful policy that tells our residents that we are listening. We are going to make sure that everyone in our city feels safe. We know that systematic changes are not going to happen overnight, and this is truly just a very small step, an important step in the right direction between this investment and the $15 million investment in the crisis assistance program. I think we're making good strides. Um, I also want to thank the, the two um, individuals who spoke today from impacted families. I think what we learned from the question and answer in those, sec in those um, parts of today's discussion Families and individuals have experienced the gaps in the current system of accountability, and they should be part of the process and the implementation of this new office. So I would just like to ask um, the city manager um, if we can, when we're implementing a steering committee, that it includes directly impacted people to oversee the implementation of the Office of Accountability and Transparency and involve them in this process. We're in a time that deeply demands this. Um, this is a really, really historic vote for Phoenix, and I look forward to voting for it today and working towards uh, greater justice in the city of Phoenix. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilwoman Ansari. Vice Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and, and thank you, Councilwoman, for both of you for those additions. I think they're really important. Um, it's. It's been a couple of years that we've been having this conversation and, and before I got on council, um, I got to work with some of the families that that have suffered through this. Um, and one of the commitments is to have better systems. Um, these this office may not stop future families for from going through what some of the families that we talked to today, but at the very minimum, we're going to be able to be responsive to them. And, and help them figure out, um, get some closure. 
to hear Anna's father and I hadn't realized that that he had passed from COVID and I literally remember him coming it was one of my first meetings on council but to hear that he never got those answers just just brings even more pain um I've sat I mentioned uh, <clears throat> Paco Valdez and, and Lore before and that situation and I got to accompany that family through a lot of what they went through um we're making great strides with CAP with OAT with a lot of the work that we're doing, um, the answers are in people like Katie and Nana and those folks I called today. And some of the folks like Pastor Stewart, Gail Knight, Reverend Walton, uh, Janelle Wood, like a lot of these folks that have been in the community have been thinking about this are gonna be crucial to making sure that we get this right. Um, but particularly those families that I believe we failed um, and hopefully no other families either have to go through the suffering that they went through, but also the additional suffering and trauma caused by our inadequate systems. And so I'm excited and hopeful today um, and ready to get this office going and, and looking forward to hopefully um, in the near future um, to also uh, be able to look into the civilian review board. Um, the motion that I did make, and I'm also happy to say um, that there have been some shifts from the last time we voted on this, and it will, I know there were some questions around it, it will have independent investigation, um, and hopefully, again, would be the key to, to create trust with the community. So thank you, and I'll be voting yes on this. Mayor? Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. So this is a question of staff. Uh, this one deals with the red line changes that were provided on Monday, correct? Ed? Yes, Councilman, that's correct. Okay, could we read into the record what those changes are? Because I think the public needs to know that. Okay. <laughs> um. They're rather extensive. Well, okay. It's important. These are pretty huge changes here that make this proposal pretty radical. I guess I would seek direction from the chair. Uh, Council uh, Vice Mayor Garcia, okay. did you put out a press release that shared these uh, changes with the public? Yes, Mayor, we've shared it with uh, all the offices and with the media. Um, and again, to Councilman DeCicio, we sent this uh, to your office um, on Monday. Oh, I appreciate that, Carlos. I really do, quite frankly. I thought that was very honorable on your end. But I still think in a public meeting, if there's nothing to hide, I think staff needs to read those changes into the record so that it's there. I mean, a press release is one thing, but this is a public meeting with the public record on it. And the changes will be available to the public. Uh, so as chair, I am not going to request th those be read. We'll go to Councilwoman Stark unless you have additional questions. Well, well Mayor, Mayor, hold on. I, no, I, I do, actually. I mean, you're starting to cut me off because you don't like where I'm going. <laughs> That's kind of, I thought we got past all this. But well, uh, the- Councilman, I I, we understand sure you will not- record. Yeah, I, well, did I say that right now? Or are you just assuming? Exactly. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get this on the record because there's a lot of stuff that I think needs to be read into the record rather than this because these are significant changes. The investigatory part of this is pretty important because now you're going to have citizens being able to conduct subpoenas that's never happened anywhere. You hurt the due process rights of police officers that are written into the Constitution of Arizona. You also have a problem is that this is contrary to state law. <laughs> so not even having police officers allowed to be on the committee is just far reaching on its own. So I'm not gonna go through every single one because quite a few there, there's quite a few changes in there that should have been read into the record. But now it looks like not reading them in there, it kind of looks like the city of Phoenix is hiding it. And that's just inappropriate. Never heard that happen before where the staff could not read into the record. So at the end of it, uh, this is just part of the defund movement that we saw yesterday at the city council. Clearly, then that failed at a five to four vote. 
one vote away from defunding the police of 35 police officers. That's what was going to happen yesterday. And this is just an extension. These are radical changes that are critical. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman DeCicio. And before I go to Councilman Stark, we'll have some I have, um, questions related to Councilman DeCicio's statement. Have attorneys reviewed the changes that are in the motion? Mayor uh, and Council, we have with us Assistant City Attorney, Chief Assistant City Attorney Julie Cree, and our outside counsel, Mary O'Grady. And I'll ask um, Julie and Mary if they can discuss their review of the ordinance. Um, Mayor and Council, this is Mary O'Grady, and um, I have reviewed the um, proposal that is being discussed today. Thank you. And City Manager, will will this be published? Mayor, yes, it will be published. Thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. As I read this about the investigative uh, uh, authority, um, I thought the, the new bill that was passed and signed into law by the governor says if there's any kind of investigation involved in a civilian review board, that two thirds must be comprised, the board must be comprised of two third police officers. It, is that, I, I guess I'm questioning, is that what you really are looking for? Mayor, Vice Council Mayor? Yeah. Oh, Mayor Councilman Stark, I would just note, it's important to note this is about the staff function of the Office of Accountability and Transparency. I think what's might be confused with it is the the proposal that will be in the future, I guess, which is the Civilian Review Board, which will be appointed. This will be actual employees of the city. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman O'Brien. Thank you, Mayor. If I could have ask a question of staff regarding um, one of the public speakers talked to quite a bit about um, not receiving the rep copies of reports of investigation. And so I'd like clarification on whether it is an investigation by OAT or um, PBS, would, would we provide copies of investigations of employees to uh, other people outside of our the city of Phoenix? Mayor and Council, um, so the Professional Standards Bureau, when they do complete investigations, those um, can be available. At times we do not supply those if we are uh, in the middle of an investigation or if there's a criminal investigation until those are complete. And so would an investigation done by the Office of Accountability and Transparency once completed be available to um, someone who filed a complaint? That is correct. Once the entire case is completed, then those reports should be made available. Okay. Um, so I would just like to share with um, council members that in the last 24 hours that my office has received over 100 phone calls and emails from the District 1 residents who are opposed to having an Office of Accountability and Transparency and certainly opposed to this, the ordinance that we're discussing. And, and actually, I should say opposed to the ordinance that was published in city materials because they would not have, unless they saw through a media release, the red line changes that were made. They feel it demeans our police department's service to the community, and they feel it is part of the defund the police narrative. District 1 constituents support our police and fire departments, especially during these times of uncertainty and unrest. Their practical side supports public safety because Phoenix is one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. The number of public safety personnel in our departments must reflect the growing needs of our city. Personally, I believe in transparency and holding people accountable, not just police and other public safety personnel, but anyone 
needs to be held accountable for their actions, including the city council. If it's a means to build trust, then my hope is that the OAT will be able to achieve that. The way that it has been pre presented to me, the OAT is to serve as checks and balances mechanism. However, the way the ordinance is written currently, there is no balance. For one, in the ordinance, ordinance, the Office of Accountability and Transparency is being mandated to employ a future director and staff members without any background in law enforcement or who have any family members who previously served in law enforcement. Essentially, we're creating an office to work in tandem with our police department, yet not have any background or experience in how these types of investigations work or are carried out. How can a department decide to provide accountability and transparency by working with our police department function without any institutional knowledge? In addition, I do want to sp specifically point out something that was redlined from the ordinance that was presented in our, our book last week. And that is that the OAT staff must strive to avoid all potential conflicts and the appearance of impropriety. Therefore, the, society, the city will take into consideration evidence of bias for or against the department and other experience in hiring process. That was redlined. Secondly, the city is creating an additional department and growing government to perform a process where one is already in place, creating multiple departments and positions performing the same task is a certainly a waste of taxpayer dollars. Currently, the Phoenix Police Department has a use of force process. The moment there's an application of force by an officer, the incident is either investigated by the Professional Standards Board or, and by the Violent Crimes Bureau. From there, the incident is either sent to the county attorney or forwarded to the use of force board, then to a disciplinary review board before ultimately going to a civil service board. There's, a, there's essentially five separate boards plus potentially being reviewed by the county attorney. We are creating another department of government to perform what is already a detailed investigation process. And what I heard today is that we need a family advocate um, as Councilwoman Guardado talked about and, and Vice Mayor Garcia to assist our citizens when they experience such a tragedy um, and need help to work through the system that we have in the Phoenix Police Department and the City of Phoenix. Again, I want to reiterate that I am supportive of increasing accountability and transparency, but by giving the Office of Accountability and Transparency full investigative authority, we are creating a system of checks and balances that has a whole lot of checks and not enough balances. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I've been probably, well, besides wearing in uh, South, we're probably the old and, and the mayor. Uh, at the beginning of uh, where what, some of the originals of when this all started and how, uh, and not necessarily of OAT, but several of the things that have started and incidents that happened in our community and how uh, conversations started uh, to get here. But actually, uh, this vote today really finally moves uh, a work of the community and work that was done has been done for decades. And we are moving the work of decade discussion to actually into action. And I think that's relevant, especially with uh, many people uh, that have been pushing this uh, for many, many, so much, so much. But when I entered, uh, what happened is in 2016, uh, the Community and Police Trust Initiative, CPTI, uh, made many recommendations. And several recommendations we, we moved forward, but there were two or three that were lingering that have now been completed. But the main one, the one that was not completed, was the civilian oversight of the police department. And 
really has been, it, it's been, I commend the colleagues today that are really uh, hearing the voice and understanding that CPTI was created by the city manager uh, to provide these recommendations for the city and for us to consider and move forward. Um, so there was uh, many voices at that table and even, I believe, included uh, law enforcement voice. Um, and so I want to be clear that the Office of Accountability and Transparency is not anti-police. And it is not defunding. So I want to get that on the record that this is not what it, that's about. And what this office uh, can be is an incredible resource for the community and the city and the police department. Uh, be, but because the goal is that the office protects civil rights and support effective policing to ultimately increase confidence in the police. So I'm hopeful for today's vote because it's our first step in moving forward. And I will be supporting uh, this uh, Office of Accountability and Transparency because we've been doing the work uh, for many, many years to get here. So I thank those that have been, I commend those that ha have been doing it and we were able to pick up and move, move it forward. So I appreciate uh, all the work that has been done and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. I too want to thank the community leaders who have been working for decades to get us to today's vote. I am also looking forward to supporting the motion. For those who are watching this and would like to read the updated draft, you can go to the Phoenix Newsroom District 8 tab and there is a link to view the current draft on which we are voting. It has many important items want to note that it includes programs that should improve our relationship between our officers and the community members, including a significant youth outreach program. I'm hopeful that that will help our officers and our young people build lasting relationships and see each other in less stressful situations than some of the contacts that might begin with a 911 call. The Office of Accountability and Transparency also has a mediation component. For some types of calls, when an officer sits down with someone in the community, perhaps if each person tells their side of the story, there will be better understanding. We heard a great story from another community about an officer who may have been a little bit aggressive, but was able to share with someone in the community that his wife had just been diagnosed with cancer and he was distracted. It turned out the uh, person who had the experience had also it had cancer in the family and they were able to move forward because they talked with each other. We also heard a story from our neighboring city of Tucson, which has civilian oversight. Their administrator saw a pattern of complaints about chokeholds. She studied it and found that there were sequential uh, badge numbers, that the officers who were having the complaints had been trained together. It, she found out that they were not trained in a Tucson specific training and had in fact received inaccurate training about the chokehold policy in Tucson because their training was not specific for the city. Those officers were at risk of getting discipline even though they were doing what they had been trained to do. Community members were experiencing chokeholds they shouldn't have. Because of civilian oversight noticing the challenge, the officers were able to get accurate training, which was a better outcome for the officers and for the community. I'm hopeful that we will find those opportunities through the Office of Accountability and Transparency. The investigations will also be important. Our residents will have a non-police location to go if they have a complaint and they do not feel confident bringing it to our police department. For those who would rather go to the police department, they will still have that opportunity. This is a big week for the City of Phoenix in terms of public safety. Yesterday, we voted on a budget that included a significant raise for all of our employees, including our police officers. We also voted to commit $15 million to have clinicians respond to 911 calls that today might go to police officers. At the same time, 
we are moving forward with the Office of Accountability and Transparency for the first time in decades. Thank you all who have been part of this process. It's an important time in the city of Phoenix. We want to have the best possible city and the best po possible public safety response. Today will allow us to have more accountability and transparency and a stronger, safer city. Any additional comments? Roll call. I'm sorry. Decisio? No. Guardado? Yes. O'Brien? No. Pastor? Yes. Stark? No. I apologize, Stark. Oh, no? Correct, no. Thank you. Waring? Uh, I'd like to explain my vote. Do. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I I don't think this will accomplish what the advocates think it's going to accomplish, so that will just breed more frustration. At the same time, uh, I'm, I'm happy it's not accomplishing what they think or want it to accomplish. But I will say this. It's three more millions of dollars that we're not spending recruiting officers. Our officers are definitely, it appears, processing that perhaps they feel city leadership is trying to make their jobs more difficult. There are plenty of outlets to adjudicate these cases or to judge the offer officers in a bureaucratic setting. Uh, there are civilians involved in those processes, including jurors. So I would argue this is $3 million that could have been better deployed, filling the gaps in the ranks of officers, because while we may have budgeted 3,100 and change officers, we only really have about 2,800 because they're quitting faster than we can recruit them. I think that's a terrible mistake. I guess the bottom line is, I think when we're down to 2,500 officers or a number like that, you will miss those that are gone. So uh, I appreciate the chance to speak and I vote no. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 5-4. Thank you. Thanks to all who worked on this. The city of Phoenix was the largest city in the country without civilian oversight. Today that has changed. We next move to our final agendized item, which is an update of the city of Phoenix policy for masking to protect against COVID-19. Vice Mayor? Oh, Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Um, motion to approve item 89. 90. 90, sorry. Second. We already did 89. 89 was the big. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. We do have one member of the public to address the council. Mr. Kleinman. Good afternoon, Ms. Mayor and members of the council. I just wanted to know if this will precipitate a return to in-person meetings um, along with the changes in the mask wearing. I know a lot of people feel that they are not getting their fair and opportunity fair and equal opportunity to share their viewpoints when everything is still virtual so hopefully this will precipitate a further motion that will bring city functions back to in person thank you thank you so much i am looking forward to supporting this motion from the very start of the COVID 19 crisis the city of phoenix has tried to be informed by data and science we are following the advice of health experts this vote will update our city mask ordinance to follow cdc guidelines for people who have been vaccinated that means that you can go without a mask in our city and in most outdoor places but uh, you will still be required to wear a mask in the highest risk places, including air travel on city buses and in light rail per CDC guidelines. Getting vaccinated makes a difference. Uh, I join everyone who's looking forward to less mask wearing and am glad to have been vaccinated. For those of you who still need to get vaccinated, the city of Phoenix looks forward to partnering with you and helping more people in our community get vaccinated. Council comments. Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Seth. Um, so yes, I just um, excited um, to see that we're 
starting to see the, the light at, at the end of the tunnel. I just cannot express enough um, the, the importance of, of getting vaccinated. I know that, you know, we, it's something that we've been looking forward to for, you know, for the, for the last year. It's been, it's been a very, a very difficult year, especially for our businesses. Um, do people wear a mask? Do they not wear a mask? And I know there's a, still a lot of businesses out there um, that, you know, the workforce is a little bit nervous about, you know, who's wearing a mask and who isn't. And, and I, you know, and I guess I just would want to encourage, you know, that everyone goes out and gets their vaccine. And I know that, you know, businesses are still free um, to ask to ask customers to put on a mask. I know that there's a lot of different businesses that are nervous for their workers, um, knowing that not a majority of people are vaccinated. So I'm hopeful um, that with this lift that we're doing today, more people will feel motivated to want to go out and get their vaccine and, and that we'd be able to get back to some normalcy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. We'll go to the Vice Mayor and then Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, from the beginning, I think it was really important for us to continue to make decisions as a city um, informed by public health officials like the CDC. Um, the pandemic, I think, is far from over, um, but COVID-19 is, you know, it's here to stay with us. Um, I do think the vaccination events are huge. Um, we're still not at the finish line. We need everyone uh, who can and is willing to get their vaccination. We, for those of you in District 8, um, invited to make an appointment uh, or walk in at Mountain Park Health Center at 303 East Baseline Road. Um, they're open from 8 to 5 p.m. And obviously there's vaccination events continuing. Um, thanks to Arizona, Adelante, and a bunch of uh, other organizations, um, including our fire and police department, who are helping out with the vaccinations. We have an event this Saturday at the South Mountain Community College. Um, so excited to continue to work together. Also excited um, that we're moving in the right direction and, and I will be supporting this item. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. Well, thank you, Mayor. And all I can say is finally, we're gonna get back to normal. I think this is good. It's a good signal to the public, a good signal to everybody else that we have common rules now amongst all cities, well, most cities at least, and the state of Arizona, so that businesses can get back. But I think what we're gonna find out, and I've said this so many times before, this entire thing, this COVID-19, will prove to be the most destructive to the children and the young adults. The gap between the rich schools, or the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor is only gonna grow. The rich schools stayed open during this crisis while the poor schools stayed shut. It's going to be the most harmful thing that adults ever did to their children. Thank you, Mayor. Any additional comments? Vice Mayor. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to make sure with, with Chris or staff um, that businesses still have the right to ask for um, masks in their businesses. And, and for those watching, I hope we respect that. But just, Chris, that's the case, right? If, if a business within the city still requests um, someone to wear a mask for them to provide service, um, they could continue to do so, right? Mayor. Councilmember Garcia, yes, there's a specific provision in the order that gives business the right to set the policies for their business. Continue to do that. Thank you, Chris. And, and I hope again for those watching and everyone in Phoenix that we can respect each other. Some folks might be ready to come back and, and, and not wear a mask and some might still want uh, to, to be wearing masks and, and ask you to do that in their uh, place of business, and I hope we all can continue to respect each other and continue to work together to get through this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, and that's an important point. We have people in our community who are not vaccinated. We have people who are vaccinated, but who have health challenges or who live with people who have health challenges. Masks can still be an important tool. The Maricopa County local governments, including Phoenix, got recognition from the federal government for our mask policies, which they said helped reduce the spread of COVID-19, particularly during the summer peaks. This was an important policy and continues to be a tool to help our community fight COVID. 
the fight is not over yet, and we still need to be careful to slow the spread of COVID-19 and to protect all of our families. Roll call. Oh. I'm sorry. Decisio. Yes. Guardado. Yes. O'Brien. Yes. Castor. Can I explain my vote? Please do. Um, I will be voting yes. Uh, I'm appreciative that we are following the CDC guidelines, uh, but I also want to make a comment in, in being respectful to those that want to continue to wear their masks to protect themselves, uh, especially those that are in the front line, the essential workers that had to go to work and didn't have the luxury of uh, being at home, or not luxury, but being able to uh, stay at home and operate at home. Um, and when they were the frontline workers uh, in our hospital, our nurses, our doctors, but also um, in our city and in other areas in hospitality and um, tourism. And so uh, I just want to make sure that we honor those that that uh, needed to go to work and kept our, our country going and moving. And also uh, those students that then had to step up and help with the family um, and uh, took on several different uh, tasks or jobs within the family while the family was at work. So I do want to recognize uh, them as they will probably continue to wear masks. So thank you. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. By a unanimous vote, the City of Phoenix has updated our mask guidelines to follow the CDC updated guidelines. That is our final agendized item for today. We will next move to the citizen comment portion of our agenda, and I will turn to our city attorney to introduce citizen comment. Thank you, Mayor. During citizen comment, members of the public may address the City Council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments, but prohibits council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you. Today we will have two citizen comments, James Dibler, followed by Sherry Slocum. Hi. Hi, I am James Dibler. I live in Phoenix, Arizona in the Phoenix Council District 5. I would like to address some concerns that have came to my attention. Last week, I was having trouble finding volunteers for the Friends of James Dibler Adopt a Street Cleanup Program. We have a low number of volunteers to sign up for the event. This week, I have good news. The volunteer numbers are up due to more people showing up at the street cleaning event and losing mats requirements for vaccinated vegetables. Cactus Park Neighborhood Alliance is joining in the effort to clean up the streets of Phoenix. Everything is getting better for the former Metro Center Mall because of the street cleanup. St. Jerome's Catholic Church priest, Father Gray, say, this is a commanding idea to adopt a street. As you say, so many are fill of garbage and need someone or a group of people to take care of them. Friends of Jane's Diver Adopt a Street Cleanup is located at St. Jerome's Mormon Catholic Church and School at 35th Avenue in Peoria. The event starts this Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning and ends at 11 a.m. 
Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our final comment is from Sherry. I wanted to say that we the people started our government to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and provide for common defense. Promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of our liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That means all the generations to come. Our Arizona Constitution backs this fully. We the people of Arizona, grateful to Almighty God for our liberties. In Article 2, Section 2, it says to protect and maintain our rights. In Section 33, you are not able to write laws that can take away our rights. Mandates are not even laws, but they are unconstitutional. You can make recommendations, but you cannot mandate away my rights. For this reason, the mass mandate must be banned, not just removed temporarily that you can put it back in place. They have to be banned. Domestic tranquility and common defense does not happen without a fully funded and supported police department. We do not have enough officers for our population, which is continuing to grow. I do not consent to one individual being able to redline an agenda item, which we didn't even get to see. You have one, we have a council for a reason, everyone working together to represent all of Phoenix. I asked Mr. Garcia to prove his claim that most want to defund our police. I don't find that to be accurate. Even with a quick poll, at most, you can find about 15% to back his stance. I ask that the red line agenda item actually be stricken. I don't believe it's constitutional. And the left has, sorry, the agenda item be stricken and left as the full council agreed upon it and that the power be removed from Mr. Garcia. He represents District 8. Even in his district, you can't find the support he is claiming. We have to have law and order. What is the replacement Mr. Garcia wants? Why isn't this part of our discussion? How many living in Phoenix want the Wild West? Fully fund our police. The OAT money should go to increasing the manpower of our police department. The use of force occurs when people resist arrest. They don't just go out and start knocking people over the head. It happens for reasons. And when there are bad apples, they are addressed and should be. And they should be held to the full extent to the law that is possible for them too. So don't just drop the mass mandates, ban them, and observe our rights. And I just don't understand how at the last second he can redline and totally obliterate half of what you guys said you've been working on for decades. And everybody just votes, okay, yeah, let's do that. So you basically redlined out. Thank you. That is our final public comment for today's meeting. We are adjourned. volunteer in the future. Our front page lands right there. Um, we are always in dire need of volunteers. Um, so we have more demand than we can provide services. Um, and it's never too late to get your name on the list so that we can start tax law training next year. I love it. You couldn't do it without all those great volunteers. I know a lot of them are, are former accountants or just business people that want to get back to the community.